Now we are building websites way faster than before. Thanks to a lot of helpful tools that gave us a quick head start in the whole process. However, time still has to be spent in every aspect, be it understanding project requirements, communicating with clients, revisions, and guess what, this list goes on. Here is Andre from Project Huddle sharing about the time mix while building client websites. So let's welcome Andre on the show and get started. Hi, Andre, how are you? Thanks for having me. I'm great. Cool. So before we get into the topic of spending time and where to spend time while building client websites, guess what? There's so many people who will be listening this. Oh, we all spend time. Why don't you give a quick introduction about your online life? Sure. So say for the past four years, I've been working on a plugin called Project Huddle, which is a dead simple way to get feedback and approval on your designs and websites. Um, it came out of sort of a frustration of trying to get feedback from clients, trying a bunch of tools and quickly finding out that clients abandon a lot of project management tools and refuse to use them just because they're super hard to use. So I decided to build something that was super simple for clients to use, but gave you all the power to manage your project in the back end. Awesome. Dead simple introduction. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now let's talk about the time that we spend on building websites. Now, while doing a website project, there are a lot of moving components and we spend time on a lot of these components. It can be, you know, initial contact, understanding project requirements, then creating design, development, revisions, final installation, aftercare, the list goes on. Now, I seriously doubt if anyone ever actually plans how much time or how many hours one should spend on specific website building stage slash milestone. Do you, do you, have you done that while you were building website and is it a worthwhile exercise? Yeah, I should mention that I, um, before Project Huddle, I had been freelancing for nearly a decade. So I do Everyone have a lot of experience does doing this. That. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I found, you know, when you talk about uh, like re making requirements, getting feedback, all that stuff. The more boring the document and task, typically the more important it is for your business. Because <laughs> when I started out, I was super excited just to build stuff and make cool designs, but I would always sort of get bit at the end because I wouldn't have these documents that keep track of project scope, that have um, communication stuff laid out, have tools that I'm using, et cetera. So, um, in my opinion, it's super important to like sort of think that stuff through before you even begin. Um, but I don't know if you want to sort of just break down each part, like let, let me know kind of how you want to handle that, I guess. Cool. Now let's start with the one very important thing. Like a lot of people who are new to this, they will do the project management via email, good at email. They will just send uh, an email to the client. Oh, this has been done. Client will respond. Okay. I need more changes. And guess what? This email thread continues. And most people don't actually use project management tool in the beginning until unless they realize or they've grown big enough that they've been spending so much time in managing project. When did you start uh, using project management tool to, you know, manage your website projects? Yeah, I actually think um, it's okay to use email at first. And I think like right away, you probably should have a face-to-face -face or video meeting with your client. I think that's where a lot of people um, like to maybe jump into a tool or something before they even close a sale. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have trouble either um, closing sales or getting leads or whatever. And I think if you meet somebody face-to-face, -face, it's a lot easier to say yes because people do business with people they like and know. And, and it's easier to make friends uh, through video. So I always found what successful is right away having a face-to-face -face meeting and just talking and not even worrying about tools. Um, and then only thinking about those types of tools once the project gets started. So what I mean by getting started is uh, either, okay, so there's two ways of doing it. Let's talk about like understanding project requirements, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you meet with the client and you need to find out what the project's about. There's two ways you can do it. The first, um, and I know Lee Jackson does this, is he actually charges to scope out a project. So he does something called user stories where this is like sort of a productized service 
somebody has a project that they don't really know how to scope out and he helps them scope it out through creating different user stories on the site. So if it's an e-commerce site, you need some, you need a customer that visits the site and what kind of interactions are they going to take? You also need maybe an accountant or a shop manager that visit the back end of the site and what kind of actions do they need to take? Mm -hmm. You have a marketing person, what kinds of things do they need from the site? So you have these user stories and you're sort of charging for this scope up front, which I think is a super cool idea. Idea. It's not always easy to sell, I think, um, with a lot of clients. I think if you're not going to do that, um, you need to at least set a ballpark at first. You can't start going into understanding requirements and creating a scope without at least getting them to agree to a ballpark. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think that video meeting or that face-to-face -face meeting is great. You can kind of take notes and figure out, okay, typically when I've done a project like this, it's between this and this price. If you want to move forward, we can sort of continue uh, from there. So I think those, those two ways I would suggest, I would not suggest doing like um, going through creating a proposal for free without even talking about price up front, because that's usually where you end up doing a lot of work and then send the proposal over and they end up either getting sticker shock because of the price or, you know, because they don't know what a website costs. I guess that's our job to sort of communicate um, so, or just getting off the mark somehow. So you're referring the concept of paid discovery, right? Right. Paid discovery. I think, you know, it's, it's definitely a little bit of a harder sell, but I think it makes more sense because thinking about, you know, somebody that's never built a website before, they don't really understand what they need. And that I feel like there's huge value in creating a document that lays out exactly what needs to be built. Kind of like, if you were to build a house, you'd go to an architect, right, to make plans and you would pay an architect to do that. You wouldn't just start building a house and just yell out things that you want to the builder while they're building it <laughs> you pay for those plans up front, right? Yeah. And that's sort of what that is. But yeah, these rules and fundamentals don't apply online, especially when you're doing website design and development because right. we are freelancers. People stress on the word free a lot. So. Right. <laughs> So besides, you know, paid discovery, I think a lot of people actually also do this thing. Like they put a minimum figure, like our project starts from $5,000 plus. So right. a client or the person who wants a website, they already have this thing in their mind. Like this guy's charges 5,000 plus. So if he doesn't have that budget, he won't even contact and he, that lead won't funnel in. Now you circling back, you mentioned that doing a video, you know, discovery call or getting to know the project requirements. Guess what? There's so many people who are website developers, they are not comfortable with video. Forget about video. They are not even right. comfortable with audio. And right. what route can you suggest to the I would say kind of too, people? I would say too bad. You got to get comfortable. I mean, you're a business owner first, right? I, I'm not comfortable on podcasts. I'm not comfortable right now, but I'm doing it for my business and I'm doing it to help people. I feel like if you can put those things first, like you know, think about going outside your comfort zone. You know, maybe the first video call you do is hard. Maybe the second one's a little bit easier. I think you, you have to do those things that are hard, you know, to further your business and yourself. Um, but I guess getting back to your question about using project management tools, I think at that point, once, once you, you do, let's say, um, do a ballpark or you start work on a, um, on like a, a requirements document, um, then I think you need to start doing um, some, kind of, some kind of management tool that's not email. And sort of my, my rule is, you know, I've used, I've tried to use a lot of different project management tools in the past. So I used, um, like I love ClickUp and nothing against ClickUp, I, it's a great tool, but I found clients do not use it because it's a whole thing that they have to figure out for themselves. So I, and, and that's, I think if you're going to go and use like a project management tool, you need at least use something that integrates with email. So clients can sort of do what they're already doing and you can handle things in the back. Um, I think a good tool for that is something like front app or Basecamp is another one. Um, or Asana. Or Asana. And then, you know, if you're doing talking about visual feedback, that's exactly why we created project huddles. So it's, there's no external service to log into. There's no, even not even a URL to go to. It's just right on top of their site all the time. You know, it's an invisible layer that 
only the two you can see. So I think once you make it as easier, in, in Project Huddle's case, easier than email, then they'll actually use it. I think trying to force somebody to use a project management tool is you're ultimately setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. Now the initial discovery is done, you have the project and now the development starts. Now, personally, when I started, I didn't have any tool stack, like which plugin I'm going to use, which theme I'm going to use, whether I'm going to use a X, Y, Z page builder, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, because when you're new, you are new to a lot of things, including that clients can dictate you what to use. Right. And I was like a lost sheep then. Now things are better. (laughs) Now I have a proper tool stack. Like I'm going to use this theme. I'm going to use this page builder. I'm going to use this tool for say custom fields. I'm going to use this for feedback and all those things. And if a client comes to me and he wants me to use a page builder that I don't use, I would not take that project. Now, how important is tool stack for a person who's building website and have keep and sticking to your standardized tool stack and not changing it on foundation level for a specific client? Like what's been your experience in this regard? Right. And I think that it's a very good question. I think for me, it comes down to that initial scope document, that boring document that we talked about. <laughs> right. And if it's, if the scope of the project, you can fit all the tools that you're already using in there. Great. You already know how, how much, it's going to take and it'll be easier to estimate the project. If it's something new and you decide you, let's say you do want to take it on because I mean, let's be honest, I like learning new tools, right? Um, Maybe that's something you have to add more time in because you have to learn how how they work and account for things that um, might not work as you expected too. So, you know, I think especially just being clear with the client about that kind of stuff helps too. Um, That's been my experience at least. Cool. So besides time that is spent on actual website design and development, the other important components is revisions and getting to and fro with the client. So if you spend four hours building a page layout, I believe you will spend at least one to 10 hours. I'm saying one to 10 hours in revisions because (laughs) because there would be one client in your lifetime that will take every hair out of your head. And, you know, you will feel frustrated. Oh man, why did I take this project? So how, do, how does one first cap on the revision aspect? Like when you are doing the discovery part. Now, once you're into the revisions, what are the, you know, best practices to, you know, have minimum time spent on revisions and yet keep the client happy and he's getting what he wants. Right. So I think um, like right away when I, when I first started doing websites, I would, estimate the whole thing out. And then I would like, okay, wait a week. I'll come back to you with like a full design of the whole site. Right. And it would be all the polish, the, 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 you know, the rounded corners and the button would be just perfect, you know, and I'd show it to him and somehow I'd be way off the mark. And I was trying to figure <laughs> out why that was happening. Um, so again, another really boring thing that you can do for your business. That's super important. Um, you know, when that meeting you should first and foremost understand the business goals for the website and then start with a site map and some sketches or wireframes. Not that you have to be concerned with layout at that point, but usually when a client comes to you, they don't really have content. They don't really know what the website should say or what things should go on what pages. I'm saying you need some kind of document that at least lays out homepage this is what we're going to say at the top, just kind of like a summary. This is what we're going to say below that. Maybe we'll have a section that says this and sort of give that to them and run that by them before you even begin design. I think when you get caught up in revisions is when you don't make it a process and you make it a deliverable. So you, in the design part should be a process in that you should have them involved with a lot of these little decisions early so that when you get further along, it's not like, big decisions have to be made in the end that would totally derail the project. Um, And the other thing too is just with the requirements document, I think, you know, Lee Jackson nails it with doing something, you know, that user story document so that if there's, because this always happens, right, where you get further along in the project and the client said, oh, we actually need this. And maybe we didn't think about that before. Well, that's something you, 
you should have probably mapped out early with those user stories. If you went through those correctly, that's probably something that should have gotten caught. If it's not something that's in these user stories, it, begins easier, it becomes easier to talk about budget at that point because we budgeted for this scope that we set out and we talked about and agreed upon. This isn't in the scope, we can do it. It'll add to the timeline and budget. And it's, they understand that. They understand that they weren't getting that to begin with because you have this scope document that you both read and agreed upon. Um, so th does that all make sense? Yep, and obviously the, how you handle those revisions, like there's a tool called Project Huddle now, right. but when right. Project Huddle did not exist, how did you handle that part of, you know, sending, you know, asking client, like, is it good enough? The red is red enough or the pink is pink enough? Right. It was, um, it was very difficult without a tool. <laughs> and, you know, some of the tools, I tried some tools too, other than Project Huddle. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them were difficult because it didn't allow me to work asynchronous, asynchronously. So it was like, a, like Slack's a good example of a tool that demands your immediate attention. So I never suggest that you give your clients access to Slack or Messenger or text or a phone or anything like that as a freelancer or small agency, only because our time is our money. And when they can interrupt you, you're no longer productive and you're no longer making money. Yeah. If they need to talk to you immediately, like we always get that, that email, can we jump on a call quick or something like that? That's when I either propose some meeting times or send them to a scheduling app, right? Because you, you can't just be available for them 24 seven, that you sort of have to like fit fit in your, your break time so that it can be productive. Um, so yeah, I used email, I used these immediate tools, none of them worked. I needed something that um, was easy for clients to use or they would just email me. Like, like I said earlier, it was, I was using a few different project management tools. They would forget their login, they would forget where they need to go. They would get there, they wouldn't know how to like create a new task or whatever, they didn't even know what a task is, some of them. If it's something that's as easy as pointing and clicking, like anybody can do that. So, so that's sort of like the mantra of Project Huddle. That's like our core value is just to making it dead simple for clients to use because then they'll actually use it and they won't abandon it. Um, and it, you know, with a with a, a a visual feedback tool like Project Huddle, it's like putting digital sticky notes on top of your website or design. So there's no confusion that comes with somebody trying to describe a change. Yeah. So like with email, it, we would use different terminology sometimes, like in the, like I would say header, but they would say in the top section, or they would say, you know, above the page scroll, like what do they mean page fold? <laughs> they mean like, what do they mean? Or they would mention a page that didn't exist, but they actually meant the about page. You get the idea. Yeah, the header but, size is big, but you remember, oh, he's saying the logo is big. <laughs> right, right, exactly. They don't know the terminology, so it, it's, and they shouldn't, you know, yeah. like, there, and there's some stuff maybe you need to talk about, and that's something that uh, I know you can put in, in that scope document, like terminology, if you really wanted to, mm -hmm. so that everybody's in the same page, but why go through that work? Why not just point and click? talk about stuff, you can have the conversation right there, you can assign people, you can mention people, it's all hooked up to email too, so it brings you back into the system when there's updates. Um, so I, that's basically why I created Project Huddle was because of that frustration with these tools that clients were abandoning. And um, since using Project Huddle, you know, it's improved and stuff and it's become something that, that a lot of people can't live without just because of that. Yeah, it's an amazing tool. I know a lot of people who are fan of Project Huddle. So I don't do that many client websites to justify using a lot of tools, to be honest, because I'm more, I've, I've changed directions for the last two, three years. So uh, it doesn't require me to, you know, talk to clients and do that thing. But I've, I know the frustration. I've gone through that. It's been like 10 years now. So a <laughs> lot of websites. <laughs> so the other thing that's, you know, coming up, obviously there are tools like Project Huddle that helps you. But there are other things like people have started using video, you know, medium, like uh, someone who wants to, even clients are getting comfortable with, like if a client wants to tell me something specific, he or she will just spin up a loom video quick and, and right. they will send me and, and like someone sometimes because I have a few coaching clients like so sometimes I have to tell them something so instead of writing a message I'll just send an audio you know for, uh, just 
talk and send it to them quickly so that they understand. I think even these audio and video mediums can be integrated in, you know, Project Huddle and similar kind of tools. So are you looking into that as well? Yeah, I mean, right now you could do the same thing. You post a Zoom link or a, a I'm sorry, a Loom, Loom link or something. You can you have a file uploads extension so you can upload audio if you want to. Um, but as far as like having screen recording stuff, that's not really planned, but uh, definitely something I could see being useful. Yeah. One thing we do, in the background automatically is when you post a comment, we take an automatic screenshot of the user's screen. Mm -hmm. So it's something that the client doesn't have to remember to do. It's, and you sort of have that information and context in hand. So um, I, I found that super useful just because the nature of um, web design, things change quite a bit, right? Between version one or version zero and version one. So, um, having that sort of like timeline and history helps tremendously, I think. Yeah. And now this is all about, you know, interacting with your client. Guess what? You also need to interact with your team members. So how did you do that in your early days? And does Project Huddle fits in here as well? Right. Uh, it's a really great question. I didn't. Um, so I worked for an agency in uh, right out of college. Mm -hmm. And we, this is before Slack and all that. So we just did email. Um, but then when I went uh, freelance, I, I worked with a lot of remote people, a lot of remote companies, and we used something called Slack. I'm sure people are familiar with it. <laughs> um, I, 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 I really hate Slack. I, I would ditch Slack if I, if I, I, if I don't I even use it now. It's okay. a time waste. Seriously. It's right. A time waste. Right. You can't even it's refer back easily. <laughs> Exactly. You can't, you can't find anything, you know, everything and there's conversations you're a part of that you shouldn't be and all that kind of stuff. So it's my biggest issue with it though, is it's, it's immediate conversation. So it's yeah. interrupting you in your day, no matter what you're doing for an immediate response, which is, is terrible for somebody that has a time-based business. You need to schedule things. You need to work and communicate on your own time. Right. I get that there are emergencies and maybe you should have a system and plan for that. But how often does that happen? You know, you should have a way to communicate that people can check in maybe every half hour or hour or something like that. So they're not interrupting their day. So using, I don't mind using um, like project Hall works great for that because you can assign internal team members. You can mention people, things like that and sort of get their attention, but you can work asynchronously with project Hall because you know, you don't need to check into Project Huddle all the time. We have a, a feature that sends email digests every, um, you can set it for every five minutes, every 15 minutes, every three hours, or, or every day if you want. And so people can sort of check in and see, like at a glance, all the things that need their attention and things that they need to do. I think that works the best, sort of that work on your own time, you know, kind of thing so you're not interrupted all the time. And then you can use, like, for huge project management tools, I think, for team members because they're they're more likely to use them because they're, you know, tech people typically. So like we would use, um, I think we used, uh, what was it called? GetFlow, I think, with a few contractors, which, which was a pretty cool tool. Um, that seemed to work really well. Cool. So you've interacted with your client, you've interacted with your team members, the project is done, and now the client is on your care plan. So how do you handle the care plan request, which comes out of the blue? It could be one in a month or it could be hundred in a month. So right. how do you allocate uh, your time for that? And what is your favorite mode of communication in that regard? Right. I mean, communication mode, I think the reason, and we, we talk about project a lot, but I think when they're looking at their site, you can have Project Huddle um, sort of enabled on their site even after launch. So it mm -hmm. only loads for you and your client to see. So when they're looking at things in their site and thinking about changes, it's always there. So they can always sort of reach for it and talk about things or request changes or whatever. Um, whereas if they use something like email, uh, again, you're going back into that, that rabbit hole of trying to explain changes things getting lost, you not really have, don't really have a way to organize it on the back end. Um, so I, I think that that's typically really effective. And I think just the nature of having Project Huddle 
sort of already on on the site. It makes it easier than email, so customers or sorry clients won't necessarily reach for email because if it's right there, they're not gonna not use it. Go open up an email program, type in an email address, type in a subject line, type in a message, send. They're typically just gonna point click and write a comment, right? So I think that works really well for maintenance plans. As far as like managing the maintenance plan scope, like that, that is totally up to your contract and sort of what you, um, what you decide to do going forward. Like Project Total won't limit the communication part of it because I think, you know, having that communication is important, especially with like a client for ongoing, um, you know, your ongoing relationship with a client. I think you should be in communication and checking in and like making sure that their best interests are still being met. So. Um, that's sort of what I found works really well. Yeah, and we've already talked about the rabbit hole what of Slack and the time drain that happens there. I know some people still use Slack for, you know, they put all your clients there and, you know, do the communication. But I guess good old project management tool or email is good enough to handle on to, you know, ongoing client communication, which is after the project is complete. Say, say that again. Like for ongoing, you know, care plan stuff, the communica- yeah. for communication, obviously tools like Project Hurdle, which again will funnel into email communication. Right. That, that is still the best option or the project management tool that gets integrated with your email is still the right. best option and not go fancy with Facebook groups or Slack or use other kinds of direct messaging, even Zoom, like, hey, start a video call. <laughs> Right. It just, it, I mean, it depends on what you want to, what you want to do. Do you want to spend most of your time talking to clients and having meetings or do you want to spend most of your time building your business, billing hours, um, creating great, great work? You know, it's like every time you have to jump on a, a call, you're, you're sort of interrupting your day and then you have to sort of kind of get back into it and figure out where you were. And then maybe somebody pings you on Slack and then you have to like interrupt your day again. It's this whole concept of being productive versus being reactive. You can't really be productive if you're always reacting to things. So I think having a Facebook chat or Zoom calls or things, I think are ultimately bad for like ongoing relationships. That being said, I think there's a time and a place for them. Like if they're scheduled, I think it's great. Like I totally think if you have a a client on a maintenance plan, you should have an occasional like face-to-face Zoom meeting just to check in and see how things are going. Only because, um, well, two reasons. One, like you have this ongoing relationship. You want, they want face-to-face contact with you to make sure that you still understand their business because things change. Um, And usually when I do those types of meetings, I end up getting more projects and additional like upsells and things that that I didn't think about. They have needs that just, oh yeah, we thought about this the other day and now while we're talking about it, let's, let's talk through it. And, you know, it could end up being an additional project, um, which I think is great. You don't have to spend more time looking for new clients. You can sort of fulfill the needs of your existing clients. I believe now you don't build websites, right? No, not anymore. No, I don't. When you were building websites, those frustrating times which which was the most you know time consuming stage during a website you know process or the time consuming item while finishing a website project for you during those days yeah uh, I have a saying that the last 20% takes 80% of the time (laughs) so it's when when you're finishing a website you're like 80% there you're like yeah I'm almost done and then that last 20% just takes like forever to get all those little details in order before you can launch something. Um, but I, as I got, as I got more experienced at doing this, I spent more time up front than previously with those boring documents. And again, like <laughs> you can have systems for this stuff. Like yeah. it doesn't have to be super boring. You can make it fun. And if you have a system, it's less time and easier to do. Um, just, just so that the second part goes a lot smoother. So I think that's, um, I think that's something that people just don't, don't want to do. So they just kind of skip 
a lot of that, that uh, due diligence up front. Okay, for now, like now you don't build websites, but I'm sure you know about the ecosystem, like there's page builders and all that stuff that's coming up. And we spend less time in actually developing the stuff as compared to, you know, those custom theme days where you go to code every div and every ID and all that stuff. Now, just taking into account the current times, like which few tools would you recommend that will help you save time and build websites? faster and you know get over with client communication faster obviously number one was be project huddle what's the number two and three and four <laughs> i um i mean i use different tools than a lot of people mm-hmm. um but you know as far as as far as like page builders um you know i think they're all so great like you can do kind of a lot with all of them <clears throat> yeah but i have a feeling that elementor is just going to take over i think they're kind of positioned best for success. They, they've already taken over. <laughs> well, they, they have, but I mean, like, like in a bigger way. I know, like, Envato had, I, I, I did Theme Force themes for a while, so Envato just sent me an email that they're going to do, like, promote this Elementor, um, uh, they call them site kits or Elementor kits or something. Yeah, sort of temp- temporary library. Temporary library. Right, right. Sort of. So Envato is like going to do a big promotion for that specific page builder, which I don't think they've done with any other page builder before. Um, but it's, it's like nowadays there's so many cool tools to like do this stuff like faster, better, easier, and make like higher quality work. Um, one that I use all the time that I'm sure a lot of people use is uh, Flywheels Local. It's been fantastic. Just even like doing plugin development, I can switch PHP versions. I can try Nginx or Apache. I can try a bunch of different things just with a few clicks. Like all mm-hmm. the other, all, a lot of the other tools, even the developer focused ones aren't aren't quite as slick. So I really like that one. Okay. So any other tool or you're just sticking? Yeah. With this yeah. I mean, I use WordPress, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now let's, okay, I'm going to rephrase my question. Let's, let's, okay. let, let's now switch to toolbox. So the, 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 okay. the, the traditional question that is asked to every guest on the show, which are your five current favorite tools that power your online business. So obviously you're not right. building websites now, but you're still working online and you're all hundred percent of your business is online. So it could right. be tools related to your business management as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, WordPress, I obviously couldn't do anything without that in my business. Mm-hmm. Um, I switched to VS Code for my editor, which is like incredible that it's a free tool that's so powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, I use a lot with Vue.js. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but um, sort of changing the interface of Project Huddle over from an antiquated backbone JS to Vue has been like incredible just as far as how stable it can be and how fast you can push out features. And then uh, anyone that writes CSS still has ever tried like um, Tailwind CSS is, is sort of like a micro CSS or utility focused CSS framework, mm-hmm. which has been like huge because especially with Project Huddle, I would have all this CSS debt, I, I guess you'd call it. So when you add, whenever I'd add a new feature, I have to add to the CSS file. And now with this utility CSS, my CSS is nice and small and condensed and loading speeds increase and all that. Um, and of course, I mentioned Flywheel too is, is, is one I don't think I could live without. Cool. And second question, I think I already know the answer, but I'll still ask you, which is your recommended web hosting service? You just gave me a hint. So. Yeah, well, actually, I used it. Flywheel is great. Don't get me wrong, like the hosting <laughs> service is great, but there's two that I like better just for hosting. Uh, Cloudways is really great for like somebody that's uh, more tech savvy, a little more tech savvy, because um, you can get like a lot of performance for like a very small price, mm-hmm. and it gives you a lot of control, which I really like. Um, and the other one is uh, Kinsta, which is fully managed. So if you don't want to think about servers, and if something goes wrong with your server, you can just send them a message and they figure it out. Kind of service, I would recommend Kinsta in a heartbeat. I think they're the fastest and the best support. I started using Kinsta almost two weeks back. Man, it's freakingly fast. Even, yeah. when, even when compared to... I moved aside from WP Engine to Kinsta. And guess what? Even WP Engine is like the premier host, right? But when right. you go to Kinsta, it's like 
ten times faster. Even the dashboard loads so fast as right. compared to so they they are doing something right in the background. I'm I'm sure, but I can feel it. Like uh, I'm I'm spending less time in you know dashboard because things are so much quicker now. Right. Exactly. That's. Uh, I've been happy. I've actually switched um, the storefront from Cloudways to Insta. I, I love Cloudways. Don't get me wrong, but I was spending too much time configuring things, and I really realized I needed somebody just to. I would pay more for somebody to manage that for me, and that's the reason I switched. But both are super fast. Cloudways is just as fast as Insta. They're both. My speed tests were exactly the same. It's just Insta does it for you. Okay. And the next question, I, again, I know the answer, but I'll still ask you. Maybe you want to <laughs> give other options. Your recommended page builder. Right. I don't use many other than like maybe Gutenberg, which I, I happen to really like. You know, it is, it's not a page builder per se, but. Um, yeah. Even I like, that, I've started liking Gutenberg, but I'm, well, it's not 100% yet. The bar is slowly going up, but right. it's still not big enough, baked enough to, you know, to build website layouts yes it's good enough to do the editor stuff and all that but not for website layouts yeah but i guess it's for a different type of site i would think you know like but again like i think elementary is gonna gonna take over they i think partially because they're doing such a great job with design i think that's sort of the differentiator it's a lot of these page builders do pretty well and elementary's pretty easy to use but the designs that you can create and the designs that it ships with like I think draws a lot of people to it. Yeah. And it has a lot of fancy stuff as well. Like, you know, fancy effects right. and, and th that does attract, especially to newbies and intermediates. Obviously for developers, they hate all page builders. So Elementor or any other page builder doesn't make sense. I think, I mean, expanding on this a little bit, <laughs> there's this whole no code movement, which I think is huge. Like, there's tools like Webflow that's like a no-code code tool. You, you do need to know how to code to do it. Exactly. But like it makes lets you do it faster in like real time. I think um, who's the Andrew Wilkinson, the CEO of Tiny Corp. He also did Meta Lab stuff. He's like a, a big tech guy and he just launched his this new startup that's doing all like no-code stuff for companies. So they're mm -hmm. like creating solutions for companies with tools that involve like no code. So like I imagine Zapier and, you know, a bunch of these other types of things just to solve business problems, which I thought was like, there's a whole company that's just doing stuff, doing like app does app development without code, which is kind of, yeah, crazy. actually tools are getting better, but we've been using tools like even WordPress is sort of a tool because yeah. we get a you know framework to, ready to build a website. Now, if WordPress wasn't there, we would be still dabbling with manual you know page creations. Remember those HTML days? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still writing HTML. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, you need to get on the no code movement. <laughs> <laughs> right, I do. <laughs> okay, next question. Any? favorite or recommended email marketing service do you do, I, do, I, you do I email marketing all. in your business i do and i i hate all of them they're all bad Seriously? every single one <laughs> i mean i'm using mailchimp right now and i hate it i think i think there's a huge like um i tried like wordpress solutions like mailpoet was pretty good i've i think i've switched to mailer light and i'm loving it to be honest mailer lights the only reason i haven't is because i have to integrate with my my storefront somehow like get um, it's really good. I've, I've heard good things, but it's just, again, like something I have to code myself to code the integration. So that's why I haven't. But I think like there's like a huge potential for somebody to build a plugin, a plugin that you can build email, like HTML emails in like Gutenberg. So like you go to like your WordPress dashboard, you build an email using the Gutenberg editor, you know, that I spits think out like the, uh, they are already there are plugins like the Mailster is kind of the popular Mailster? one. Mailster? Yeah. Do they use the Gutenberg editor or do they no. have their own editor? They use their own stuff, but you can build right. the you build the layout within, you know. It's sort of like they register custom. I I'm not too sure, but what I I can you know assume is like they make a custom poster which is obviously hidden from the front end and you can right. design your stuff and you connect your SMTP and other, you know, email transactional service like Mailgun and all that stuff to, you know, get going. Right. I've, I've seen, I've seen them do that, but those, their editors are always so, 
hard, like terrible, you know, yes. like even MailChimp for such a big company, like building emails with it is just like painful sometimes to try and get it to do what you want it to do. I guess if you want to do anything other than like one or two columns of like text and images like you want any kind of strange layout or anything, it's like really hard to do. So I don't know. You, you can do really good layouts in MailerLite because they have like a modular page builder kind of a thing. Okay. Like you can drag columns, you can drag kind of different modules of images, videos. In MailChimp, that it, MailChimp doesn't have that kind of flexibility. MailChimp has its own problems. It's good enough for starters, but it's right. and now the pricing is also gone out of the window for some lot of people. Right, and so, paying an, an exorbitant price for like yeah, not that much value, I think. For that, MailerLite is value for money in terms of pricing as in and features also. I've tried others as well. I think the main thing about email marketing is also the deliverability aspect. Mailer like the delivery rate of emails and they all land in right inbox, not in spam folder, mm-hmm. is really good because that's great. They have their automated, you know, email list cleaning. So when even if you upload an email list, they will actually clean the email and let you know, oh, these are like spam email IDs. So we're gonna put it in separate folder. And this is automated, like they do it when you upload a list. So cool. they've, 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 they're, I wouldn't say cleverly, but they've smartly covered a lot of things in the background so that their platform doesn't get, you know, labeled as spam when they're sending right. out emails. So it's, it's good. Yes. Yeah, it's their email marketing system. Either they are very expensive and complicated or they are, or they are very cheap and they don't work in terms of deliverability and all that stuff. So right. I guess it's 2020. So after project huddle, we can have an email huddle. Right, exactly. <laughs> or someone else build it. I don't care. I just want it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So last question. Any upcoming tool or service that has caught your attention? I recently. Yeah, I mean, this one might be a little more tech focused for people. Um, mm-hmm. There's a JavaScript library called Alpine JS. Mm-hmm. It's like a, for people that have used Vue.js before, and one sort of like that same functionality without loading this whole huge library, this virtual DOM, all this other stuff that you don't need. You just want it like, let's say a drop down menu in like a modal, you need just like basic JavaScript functionality. Like Alpine JS is hands down like awesome. It's like de- super like declarative how you like, you write it all in the HTML file. So you don't even need a separate JavaScript file. You can sort of just add these tags to your elements on the page and you can make all kinds of interactivity like super easy. So I've, that's been super cool to see. And I think they were just on um, Full Stack Radio, which is another podcast if you want to check it out. Awesome. So before we wrap this episode, where can people find you and what can you help people with? And I know you don't build a website, but you can still help people with a lot of things. Right. I'm, I can still help. I can just share all the mistakes I've made over the years <laughs> and how to do it wrong. So um, you can find me. You, we have a Facebook community, Project Huddle Facebook community. So it's facebook.com slash Project Huddle. Mm-hmm. See the community there. Follow Project Huddle on Twitter. Or just follow me personally. You'll see my, my Twitter handle. I think maybe we'll put it in the, below the, the video in the show notes probably. Yeah. But it's... It's yeah. my, my weird last name, so I won't say it. <laughs> Which I didn't dare to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about Project Huddle, I think Project Huddle has seen a lot of activity in the last one and one and a half years. Like you've been pumping out yeah. features like anything. What's going on? Yeah, I've been super lucky. Like, um, so when it started, I was doing freelance stuff and Project Huddle for quite a while. Um, and then it reached a point where, you know, it sort of got a lot of traction so I could fire all my clients quick and decided to go full time on Project Hull and see where, see how far I could take it. So that was super cool to see and, um, you know, like thankful that all these, a lot of people have like sort of helped me along the way. And um, you know, the hardest part so far has been like just marketing, like building it is fun and easy in a way easy marketing is just a whole nother thing and creating content is super tough too. So I've been yeah. learning that sort of like trial by fire for the last year and a half. Yeah. You know, for developers, 
building is like 100% activity but if you look at the overall you know a product and the success of a product actually development is just 50% 50% is or last yeah or, or because last. because 50% or more than 50% is actually telling people or, uh, you know, conveying the message, right? Like what you've, ma- what you've made and converting and having conversions because in today's day and age, you need to be at top of your messaging game. And because now the right. mediums have, you know, diversified, you just can't write a blog post or do a Facebook ad and get done with it. No, you have to interact with the community. And because right. word of mouth sales are more than compared to you know because in our wordpress ecosystem uh, having a good reputation and you know having good word of mouth is more important than just having a fancy product to be honest right that's that's how i've been getting by and i think if i ever do any other anything else in the future i would definitely start with the marketing component i would start with (laughs) a landing page at least that explains what it does and (laughs) you know rather than sort of build the thing and then see what happens you know it's i don't know I yeah. think I got lucky with Project Huddle, but I can see a lot of people building something that they didn't ever find customers for. So Yeah, validating an idea, it's very important. It's not just for right. projects, even for courses. Like I've been building courses for the last three years. Now, obviously, my first two courses came without validation because, hey, when you're new, just build it. Let's see what happens. Right. But now when I do it, like I make sure that I validate it. Like uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a difficult process. Like you people put fancy terms like validation and all that, like they confuse. Like It's just like spin up a landing page. If enough people sign up to get updates, man, your idea is something that you can work on. Like, right. Exactly. I think that's a good validation. So you just judge interest. Start. Yeah. Because we, we tend to add complexity to even simple things. Uh, and we don't keep simple things simple. Like project huddle has kept the client communication simple. That's why right. it's working right for a lot of people so keep it simple right <laughs> right i that's and that's something that it took a while to figure out actually it's <laughs> one of those oh. things that you know we would and maybe this is like just normal but we would add things that would make things more confusing and then get your feedback and like what are what are the values of projects all? what should it be like we didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even know that and yeah. You know, like, why was it successful for me when I was using it? It's like, oh, because clients actually used it. (laughs) That should be the most important thing is that clients will use it, right? Yeah. Number one. Yeah, because you don't need to build big documents for these kind of things. Uh, It could be just one line because, hey, because we are living in real world now, you don't need to have 1400 uh, words blog post to convey a message you can actually do it in 100 words if you can right. clear enough so because no right. one has time these days to read 1400 words they can read 100 words they don't even read 100 they just want to see one image and make sense of it and get done with right it. exactly. okay man thank you so much for your time Have yeah a- thanks for having me on it's been awesome